Hey everyone, welcome to Gateway's worship service. We're so glad that you're here today. If this is your first time checking us out, please let us know so we can help you get connected. Today our call to worship comes from Psalms 20. Let's read that together. Psalms 20 says, in times of trouble, may the Lord answer your cry. May the name of the God of Jacob keep you safe from all harm. May he send you help from his sanctuary and strengthen you from Jerusalem. May he remember all your gifts and look favorably on your burnt offerings. May he grant your heart's desires and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy when we hear of your victory and raise a victory banner in the name of our God. May the Lord answer all of your prayers. And that's our prayer for you today, that God will meet you wherever you're at.
My name is Mark Humphreys. I'm one of the pastors at Gateway Church in Merced. I'm here today at the uh, Mount Hermon Christian Conference Center. I have a lot of memories here because back when I was a kid, my family and other families within our church community, in fact, throughout the whole area would come here for a week in the summertime. And the adults would go off into a meetings every day. And all of us kids would be involved in various camps and activities. And we would learn about Jesus, learn about our faith. And it was just a place where you could just be real and be safe, and you didn't have any of those kind of pressures that maybe you did had uh, at home. Uh, I remember, in fact, when in high school, we called it high camp. It was the first time I raised my hand, and I didn't feel weird about it because others were doing it as well, and it was just kind of expected. The thing about it is we often talked about it as being, uh, it was kind of like a, a mountaintop experience. And then when we went back home, we found ourselves kind of, our faith and our enthusiasm just kind of sliding back down because of the pressures or feeling awkward with people that were around you. And, and so it was, uh, it was just one of those things where it was just a nice place to, a comfort place. I think sometimes Sundays are that way too. We kind of come on a Sunday and I think it's a place where we feel like, you know, we meet friends that are other believers that we sing and we worship and, and we, we listen to the preaching and it's just a, a comfortable place because everybody's there for the same reason. We don't have any pressure necessarily that we would have in other places. And then we go out through the week and we find ourselves slowly being pulled back down into the worries of the week. Well, the nice thing about the church was even when there were crises around us, we could still go to the church. When it was uh, the earthquakes or when it was 9-11 uh, or the, the campfire over by Paradise, uh, as tragic as that was, we could come together, we prayed, but the church was a place that you could go. Well, the last, as everybody knows, the last few weeks with the COVID-19, all of that has been changed. Globally, churches are having to rethink what it means to be the church. We don't have the comfort of coming together, and so we're trying to have to redefine and rediscover what does it really mean to be the church. Last week, we started a series called Refocus. Pastor Al had talked about refocusing our eyes on Jesus and making sure that he's the one that we keep uh, our attention to and that we look to at all times. This week, I'm talking about refocus in being the church. What does it mean to be the church? And to do that, there's a passage in Acts 2 that is, is kind of the litmus test to define what the church is like. It's something that um, some churches actually call themselves 242 because of it. It's Acts 2, 42 through 47. I want to look at that today and be able to kind of figure out and, and refocus ourselves on what it really means to be the church. And so let me just read that passage first of all. It says this, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone who, as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Now, I know what you're, you're, if you're listening to that and looking that up, you'd say, hey, wait a minute. In verse 46, it says they met together daily in the temple courts. Isn't that what Sundays were about when we come together? Well, kind of, because back in that day, their experience on worship or coming to God was at the temple. So when Christ came and they, they believed and accepted this new life in Christ as a follower of him, the, the temple was where they would go because that's what they were used to. But when you follow along in the next few chapters, in chapter 8, everything changed. 
We read in chapter 8, verse 1, it says, On that day, you know, there was a day after Stephen was stoned to death. He was a follower of Jesus. It says, Great persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and were mourned deeply for him, but Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off men and women and put them in prison. From that moment on, the church was no longer defined or looked at as a place at a temple, but it was moved out into the world and into homes. And it's a reminder to us when we think about and refocus on the church that the church isn't a building. It's not a place. In fact, in the scripture, there's no reference to the church as a location or as a building. It was always a reference of a group of people. And so that's what I want to look at today as we go through this and spend a little time together because I want to look at it, um, and I'm here alone actually, in a, a beautiful surroundings here because I want to look at it as individuals and understand what does it mean to be the church individually. That in fact, I think God is trying to show us and get us to wake up and realize that it's not the comfort you know, of the, of the building and coming together but it's so much more. In the day of Jesus, they actually didn't call them Christians or even the church. They called them the way. What they referenced was the fact that when they followed Christ, they, it, it sent them down a different path, a different journey, a different direction, and they were following the teachings of the apostles and what God was saying because they wanted to go down the path and follow Jesus where he was teaching them to go. And so we're going to go on a journey together as well. And I want to take through this passage and look at some of the markers uh, uh, that identified what a, a follower, what a member, a believer, a, a body of the church looked like that could be carried with no matter what your circumstances are. Even in our situation today, we can still be the church regardless of where we are. So join me as we head out on this journey. Well, each of us on, our, on a unique journey, depending on our circumstances, might be struggling with uh, finances or health issues, emotional issues, whatever. And I, maybe life's really good right now. And that phase of your journey is the same. We're really all going the same direction as believers. And so the things that we learn, the markings that we're talking about apply no matter what your circumstances is. So we go back to look at the passage that the read. In verse 42, it says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Right away we see four pillars, four markers of what a believer, what a, what a, a person who's in the church, a follower of Jesus is. The word devotion is meant to, to mean a wholeheartedness, fully all in um, dedication to what they believe. So when they say they're devoted to the apostles' teaching, everything about the word that the apostles were teaching they wanted to know and they wanted to take and apply it to their life it wasn't enough to just like read a book and forget about it but it was it gave them life and so they paid attention to what they said they didn't have the benefit of the bible necessarily but we know that when we read the new testament they're all the writings of the apostles and that's what they listened to second corinthians 3 16 says all scriptures god breathed useful for correction, training, rebuking, guiding us into righteousness. So they knew the words of the apostles were from God. We, we talk about in one of our values of loving God, which means a desire, a devotion, a heartedness to want to know him and want to grow in him. And we know that when we read and study the word of God, we learn about who God is. But it also gives us direction like the path I'm walking down here that becomes so clear. The word of God guides us and keeps us in line in the boundaries, keeps us from avoiding the dangers of falling down the cliff to be able to try to make the right choices when we're looking at do we go right or do we go left. We can always go to the word of God to be able to determine what is it that God wants us to do. Uh, Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is is a lamp unto my feet, a light to my path. So if you're in darkness right now, 
the Word of God gives you light. If you're confused of the direction, the Word of God gives you direction. And the marking of a believer in being and knowing we are the church is that we wholeheartedly, devotedly follow the Word of God. It doesn't matter what I say or you say. The question is, is it what God says? And that's what we want to follow. Along with being devoted to the apostles' teaching, they were devoted to fellowship. We use the word community, that we are connected into community. Scripture says that when one suffers, we all suffer. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. We're never meant to journey through life alone. If you were to go hiking through one of these trails or head out, they always say, tell someone where you are in case something happens to you. If you're to mountain climb, you know, if you've ever saw, if you slip and fall, you have a rope tied between you and the other person so you don't fall to your death. We are meant in the journey of life to be able to help each other, not only to interpret scripture and help us understand what God is intending, but also just to be able to encourage and strengthen each other. You know, it's interesting, I'm in this uh, coastal redwoods. They are among the tallest trees in the world. If you see the group of trees behind me here, uh, what's interesting about them is that they have very shallow roots. One tree's roots could go as far as 100 feet, they say. But the thing, because they're so shallow, is if they were standing alone and there was a storm and a wind or something like that, likelihood would be that they would fall over. But they don't. Why? Because the roots are all intertwined together. And so one tree is helping hold up the other tree that's helping open the other tree. And together, they're immovable. And that's the way it is with the church when the church is the people. That I myself uh, have the reliance of God and, and the devotion to his word, but because I am with others, I am never alone. And the enemy can't attack. That's what we try to communicate when we say as a church to love each other. We talk about connecting and caring for each other so that we are never alone. I know for some of you, you're struggling right now and uh, maybe don't even have a job or income and yet you're not telling anybody. That's not the way. The way is to let us know. So that we, like in the early church, they would sell stuff. I mean, back in their day, when they became a believer, in all likelihood, they would lose their income. Because you had to go into a marketplace, you had to offer a sacrifice to the God of that city. And if you didn't do that, then you can't sell there. So their, their business would die. And they were like us today, totally incapable of earning anything. So the church sold stuff. Believers sold stuff so God could use it to help other people. And I know people are doing that today. I've heard some people say that when they get their stimulus check, they want to use it to help other people. I think that's a beautiful thing because we're supposed to take care of each other. That's what a devotion to fellowship is. And that's a marking of the church. So another part of what they were devoted to, it says, was breaking of bread and prayer. We're going to talk about the breaking of bread in a minute. It really is a celebration of the gospel and what Jesus has done for us. But a part of it tied to that was this idea of prayer, a devotion to prayer. You know, prayer is the weapon of the church more than anything else. And yet it's often something that we neglect or the last thing that we think of. And we shouldn't. God has invited us. Jesus himself said in Matthew 13 that my house will be a house of prayer. And so prayer is the first thing that we should be thinking of doing, lifting each other up in prayer. Part of what prayer does, it's a communing with God that we're able to read his word and it comes alive as we listen to his spirit guiding us in what he says and we're lifting up our requests. We're giving him praise. It's a relationship and God connects us with him through prayer. It's a way in which the Holy Spirit, as we pray, takes our prayers and aligns them with his truth and with his will. And when we align our prayers with God's will, God releases his will and we see those prayers answered. Sometimes our prayers aren't answered when we wanna 
you know, pray for this virus to go away or we want to pray for something for us. And sometimes God has a different plan. But we also know in studying his word that we can trust him. But sometimes he's waiting to hear our prayer. And we, if we don't pray, if God answers, how do we know that he did it? When we, when we pray for someone who's sick in the hospital and then they get better, um, you know, miraculously we realize that, well, maybe prayer was a part of that. We see God at work when we're looking for the answers to prayer. And so prayer needs to be a daily part of our life for praying for ourselves and lifting God up in praise. Uh, you know, they talk about acts, adoration of God, confession of our sins and what's going on and, and um, thanksgiving for all the things God has done for us. And then a supplication is the S. It's really lifting up the needs of others. We're called to do that. We used to do that a lot. It's a challenge right now as a church to find a way in which we can reconnect people in prayer. And so if you need prayer, go to the website. Click pray for me. Let us know because we have a team of people wanting to pray for you. So there's a fifth area of devotion I think is a marking of the church that we see in this passage and certainly through the other passages in Acts and that is a, a devotion to God's mission. We know that Jesus said to all the followers that you will be my witnesses, an invitation for us that our life itself will be a witness to who Christ is and, and the gospel message. In Matthew 28, he said, go and make disciples. It was this act of, you know, it wasn't like, hey, go hang out in a church and feel good and create some comfort. Go and protect yourself from the world. No, it was, it was an action that we need to go and be able to make disciples. In 2 Corinthians 5.20, um, we actually are called to be ambassadors, it says, for Christ. If God is you know, pleading his case through us, that we have the ministry of reconciliation as we go out and live for him and serve him and, and live openly and vulnerably our life, other people are drawn to the same message of the gospel that we have, and they can be able to grow from that. And so we see through this passage as we look that, you know, it says they broke bread together and they hung out together. And again, they were doing it openly. And it says, and praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, it's interesting because in the persecution of the church, this was not the place to go. It wasn't like some, hey, it's a great hangout. In fact, if you made the choice to follow Christ, you were guaranteed to, to certainly be persecuted, possibly lose your income, and, and maybe even your life. Jail was a normal part of the Christian life. And so why would people want to become part of the way, part of the church? Because they understood the gospel message that Jesus offered of reconciliation with God. You know, there, there are stories about the history of the church where the church made choices that cost them. There's one in particular that, you know, I came across. And this was a guy, uh, uh, his name was uh, Eusebius of Caesarea. He was a third century historian. He wrote about the history of the church. And... There was a plague and the sickness that was sweeping a city and he wrote this, he said about the unbelievers, he called them the, the um, heathens. He said, they deserted those who began to be sick and fled from their dearest friends and they cast out into the streets, uh, they, they cast them out into the streets when they were half dead and left the dead like refuse, unburied. And then he goes to say about the church in that day, he says, however, he said, they unsparingly in their exceeding love and brotherly kindness they held fast to each other and visited the sick fearlessly and ministered them continually, serving them in Christ. And they died with them most joyfully, taking the affliction of others, drawing the sickness from their neighbors to themselves, and willingly received their pains. And many who cared for the sick gave strength to others, to others died themselves, ha having transferred to themselves their death. What's that saying? You know, it's certainly saying they didn't go out and fight for legal rights or anything that is a church. They ministered to people who couldn't be helped by others. They showed love and compassion. That's the call of the people in the, in the church. And they were willing to risk to be able to care for others and sick, even if it meant death to themselves. Those are the stories that drew people to the gospel, to believe in a God who would uh, empower people uh, and make them so devoted that they would sacrifice themselves for a savior who sacrificed himself for them. So I said earlier 
that they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. It was really the communion, the Lord's Supper, which was really a testimony to the gospel itself, that they were celebrating what Christ had done for them. I don't know if you've ever heard the bridge analogy when I'm talking about the gospel. It, it, it goes something like this, and I'm kind of here between two pieces of land and a kind of a chasm in between to give that illustration. And the story, it says, because of sin, there's this chasm between that was broken between us and God, and it broke this relationship. And as a result, we were no uh, longer to able to have a relationship God like we wanted. We would, uh, on, on the side that we're on is, is sin and disease and brokenness and death. And as much as we try to be good or do good things, nothing is good enough because on the side of God is perfection and beauty and holiness and eternity with him. He is a, he's a God that cannot have any ounce of sin around him. And so it was hopeless, except because of Christ, he created a way, he created a bridge between death and life, between darkness and light, that because of what he did on the cross, and, the, uh, and his penalty paid with his own blood, we can spend eternity with God as a free gift, the scripture says. It's as simple as that. And so they celebrated that. That was their motivator for living their life. The gift that Jesus Christ gave from them, and it was a small price to pay for whatever would happen to the life in response of gratitude for what he had done. And I wanna invite you to be able to consider that for yourself. We're gonna be celebrating communion here in a minute and it's for believers. But you can be a part of that now by just simply admitting that you need a savior, that you can never be good enough to be able to live in the presence of God because of your own sin. Believe that Jesus Christ offered as a free gift salvation through his death and his resurrection, that his blood paid for the penalty for all of your sin, past, present, and future. And then commit yourself to giving yourself to him, to let him be Lord of your life and following him. And if you're interested in doing that, let me just pray really quickly right now, just a simple prayer, just saying, Lord Jesus, I acknowledge I need a savior. I know that there is sin in my life. And I ask you and believe you have given yourself and died for me. So I ask you into my heart and into my life. I believe in you. I confess my need for you. And now I commit my life to you and ask you to open my eyes and my heart to who you are and guide me on the path that you have me on. And I pray this in your name, Lord. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, congratulations. You're a believer. And what I ask you to do Go to our website if you're not on it already. Click on the next steps. Let us know you made that commitment so we can have someone follow up and give you a gift on the start of your journey and be able to begin to connect and fellowship with others so we can journey together. So scripture tells us that the night that Jesus was betrayed, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians that he, had, he was celebrating the Passover together. And the Passover was the same celebration of a bridge it's a reminder of what God did in delivering Israel from slavery and sin and death into freedom and life and a relationship with him. And the lamb that was slain, the blood that was put on the doorstep was the bridge between those two things. So when they're celebrating, they're remembering that and they're being reminded of, of the way in which God delivered them. And so um, Jesus, when they were eating together, he took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And they understood what he was saying because this, the body of the lamb was what they were eating that night. It was remember that that lamb gave of himself as a sacrifice to nourish them and to give them life. And so we celebrate that. That's the gospel message we celebrate, that when we live and we devote ourselves to the way that we know we do it because of Jesus and what he did for us. And so take the bread that you have and remember and believe that Jesus offered himself for you as a living sacrifice to give you life.
Then the scripture says that after that evening, when they were together, Jesus took a cup, had wine in it, and he said, um, you drink this cup, it's a sign of my, this is my blood, you drink this cup, it's a new covenant um, that is for you, and do this in remembrance of me. It's a reminder that symbolic to this idea of the blood that was shed to give life, that he shed his blood for us. And because of his blood, the penalty of our sin was wiped away. So we're no longer held to that because Jesus took that penalty. So that's why scripture says that God could see us as holy and blameless because he sees us through the filter of Jesus' blood. And so we take the juice that you have and we hold it up to Jesus out of gratitude for him, knowing that his blood was shed for complete forgiveness of all of our sins. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, we thank you for the gift that you've given us. This bridge that you've given us from death to life, from darkness to light, from the brokenness and the uncertainty and the pain of this world to the promise of eternity with you and the hope that we have to live with freedom and with you. We thank you for your word that guides us. We thank you for the fellowship of believers that help hold us up and hold us together. We thank you for the reminder of, of the elements of communion and the prayer that we have to commune with you. We thank you for the mission that you give us, that we have the privilege of serving and being a part of what you are doing to reach people for yourself. And so we dedicate ourselves to you, Lord, and ask your spirit to draw us not only into your presence, to but be a part of your mission. Guide us along the way. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Well, thanks for hanging out with us. Hopefully you're able to refocus what it means to be the church. Maybe for the first time you're becoming a part of the church and the believers, and we welcome you to be a part of that. I invite you to go back to our website and click on Next Steps and let us know if we can be praying for you, uh, to let us know what your needs are, if you want to get involved, to connect, that's a place to go. Because if you are devoting yourself to God's teaching, you're devoting yourself to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer, and to his mission, then we want you to, to be a part of what God's doing through us. And we invite you to click on the below and on the wherever you click, and let us know so you can join us in God's mission together. Have a great week. Hi, my name is Mark Humphreys. Hey, Pastor Mark here, coming to you from a location that I'm going to be doing this week's message. In fact, the first time, see, I'm going to go back. Is your phone ringing? You got your phone? Coming to you from an undisclosed location.